And so from January 1st of last year until today, I've been serving as your mayor uh, here in the city. And as he said, it, it has been an interesting uh, time to do this. And uh, there's it, it a lot of things we can talk about later. I'll be happy to, to uh, answer a lot of questions for you. Uh, but before I do, just gonna give you a little bit of an overview about the city that, that all you guys live in. We have, of course, you know, they do the census every 10 years, so we don't know the exact population, but we have around 56,000 or so folks that live here in the, in the city of Anderson. Uh, those folks rely upon our city government to provide a lot of services that they need. One of the things that we do, for example, is the fire protection, uh, the police protection, uh, you know, trash pickup, the roads, make sure the roads are, are safe, that we have clean drinking water, our sewage system, power and light to make sure we have lights, uh, and all the infrastructure that goes along all with that. We have uh, about 670 employees that work for the city. We have about 20 departments that are here. The gentleman that came with me today, who's sitting back here listening, his, his name is David Ikes, and David is the chairman of our Board of Works, and he's also the deputy mayor of the city. And what the Board of Works does is they oversee the daily operations, day in, day operations of the city, particularly as it relates to matters that don't have direct involvement with uh, fire and police. Everything else they, they oversee, particularly with regards to the utilities. So they have a, a very important job uh, that we work with every day. We also have a lot of different boards and commissions uh, that are set up in the city that I have many of the appointments on, and those folks oversee different departments subject to board oversight by different different boards. Plus, each of those uh, different departments usually have a superintendent or director that oversees the department. So for example, uh, fire and police, we obviously have a, a, we have a, uh, a fire chief and we have a chief of police, but overseeing them is a safety board, and those folks I appoint. And then of course, under them, there's all the various officers and so forth. And we have a similar setup in each of the, in each of the various uh, areas that we cover. So for example, we have our utilities department, we have a power and light super Superintendent, we have a water superintendent, and we have a water pollution control superintendent, and they also are overseen by the by the Board of Works. And then there's all of the folks that work under them that actually do the day in, day out activities. So that's a little bit about the about the structure of Anderson uh, and the way the, the government works. We also have, in addition to the mayor's office, we have a city council. Uh, the city council is an elected body. They are basically, as you know, there's three branches of government uh, that we typically have, and we have the administrator or the executive branch, which in this case is the mayor. When you're talking about the city, uh, we have the legislative branch, which is the city council. When we're talking about the city. And then we have a judicial branch, which in our case, we do have a city court, and each of those uh, operate independently with some checks and balances between the two. The city council is made up of, of nine individuals. Uh, three of those are elected citywide, uh, and the other six are divided up into six different districts that they, they slice the city up based upon census track data and information. But they all, everybody runs, the city judge, the mayor, uh, and the city council folks all run at the same time every four years. And when, when you get elected, you serve uh, a four-year term, and all of those offices uh, happen to be offices that you can repeat yourself over and over again. So there's no term limitations. The only limitations is the limitations that you, the public, decides when they go to the elections or if somebody chooses to not run for office. So you, it's always decided by the, by the individuals who, who go and vote. And that being a topic, let me just remind all of you, because you guys are at the age close there, if not some of you almost there now, uh, that when you are 17 years of age uh, and you become 18 in November of an election year, you can vote as early as 17, so long as you'll be 18 by, by November. So I would encourage all of you who are at that or near that age, when it comes time, that you take the opportunity to register to vote uh, that you take the opportunity to learn about the individuals that are running for the various offices that they may be, and that you give good consideration to their qualities and qualifications, and particularly how they fit into how you, how you view things should be done, and then that you exercise your, your rights to vote when you're given that chance. Because I can tell you, and you guys know this from reading the paper and reading the internet and so forth, that 
we have the number of people that don't vote is so high that those folks, if they would get out and vote and energize themselves, they could always make a change and, and government could be however they choose to be. So you have really in your hands the power to have government run the way that you believe that it should run. And so I really would encourage you. Like I got in, uh, interested in politics when I was a little kid, really, a lot younger than you guys. And uh, I've just always been interested in it. And if you take some interest in it and get involved, I think you find that it's a, it's, it's a good profession. I know there's a lot of negative of stuff about, about government and politics goes on these days, but it's been like that for years and years and years. There's a lot of good folks involved in it, but it's only as good as the people that, that like yourselves, who work to help make it better by both voting and participating. So, so I definitely would encourage you guys to, uh, to do all that. Uh, with that said, I could, get, I could talk for a long, long time because we've done a lot of stuff uh, this year. Uh, and I don't want to you know, bore you to death. So what I'd really rather do, I think, is, is try to answer some questions. And I will tell you that um, <laughs> it's been my experience that when I ask folks for questions, particularly young folks, uh, you guys tend to have um, uh, better questions, more thought out uh, ideas, and quite frankly, sometimes more difficult to answer. Uh, but I want to try, and I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have uh, about, uh, about the city or about government or any other topic that you really want to talk about that I might be able to answer so Uh, there's certainly self-satisfaction, obviously, if it's an area that you're interested in, in being involved in and, and you're fortunate enough to, to get elected, you get satisfaction from that because it's something you wanted to do. Uh, but I believe that not only myself, but most of the people I know that, that engage themselves in running for office really do want to, to do things for the community, uh, do give back. Uh, oftentimes they're interested in policy issues. Um, you know, for example, there's a lot of folks obviously running and, and you know, doing our government services at their state level right now. Of course, the federal level with the recent uh, change of the presidents. So people that get involved at those levels tend to want to be involved in the policy issues that they can you know, have some effect on. Because obviously we're down here at the city level, and so we can do things within the city government, but we obviously can't, our power doesn't go up, but it come, kind of comes down. So if you have an interest in, in getting things done in your community, you know, running for mayor, running for a council position, something like that can be very, you know, very productive for the community and for yourself. So that's the reason I've been engaged in it, like I said. I've been interested since I was a little kid. Uh, my dad was involved in, in government, and uh, I think I kind of grew up around that. And so uh, it just it was natural for me. And so that's why I do it and why I enjoy it so much. Uh, when, you, when you're in a position that I am, again, you start off with the understanding that one of our basic jobs is to make sure the day-to-day -day activities uh, that the city's responsible for and what folks pay tax dollars for gets done and gets done well. So again, you know, good fire protection, police protection, roads improved, all those sort of things. But as you're doing that and as you're moving, as you're moving forward, what's really important is you try to look back and you try to say to yourself, where's the city now? Where's it been? And where can we take it in the future to make it a better, a better place? We're constantly looking at what we might be able to do to improve what we refer to as the quality of life. Uh, it's very important, I believe, that if we're going to uh, let Anderson grow, as like I said, we got around 56,000 people or so. When I was a kid, when I was your guy's age, Anderson had about 71, 72,000 people. And you all know the stories because you've heard them, you know, you've heard your parents, heard your grandparents talk about it, that with the loss of the General Motors jobs and the way the economy kind of changed, that obviously people left, we've had folks pass away, uh, younger people as they, they get their education going, sometimes they leave. And it's important that we have a, a good city where people want to live, where you guys, when you get out of school, once you finish your education, you say to yourself, hey, this town has a lot to off offer, I want to stay here. Versus is taken off because if you take off you know especially folks you guys work hard you do a great job you have great reputation your school has great reputation if you guys don't stay and if you don't become part of our community then our community comes less and less every day so it's important that we work to try to make it such that you would consider staying here so there's a multitude of things that we can do, and there's a multitude of things that we try to do. One of the things that we've been working with is to try to work with our manufacturers and our new companies that are coming in, and we do work to bring in new businesses on a 
on a regular basis. Uh, as you guys know, probably if you've went out towards the south part of Anderson and 73rd Street area, we have two or three new factories going in. Uh, we have some indications that we're going to possibly get another one we've been working on. If we can get more factories and, and manufacturers, and really these are advanced manufacturers, these aren't the, you know, the old factories of yesteryear. These are, these are folks that are working with uh, robotics and, and uh, with a lot of machinery and equipment that needs coded. And a lot of, it's a lot of great jobs for a lot of people that have the, have the training. So we're trying to attract them, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure that those, those entities understand that we need them to hire local. We need them to reach out and to hire young folks and folks that, that would like to have jobs here rather than hiring from somewhere else. I mean, I'm in favor of everybody getting a job, but I really want to take care of my community first. I want to see the local folks that live here have an opportunity. So we've been working with uh, the schools. Uh, part of one reason I'm here today. We try, to work with, uh, we try to work with the schools to get the word out that we have these opportunities out there. That way, young folks will see that there are opportunities here for them to stay. In addition to that, we want to do what you guys are already doing, and that, and that is having quality education. We've got to have quality schools, quality education, again, because if I live somewhere else, I don't want to move somewhere if I don't think we have a good educational system. So when I look at your school, it's a great school. You guys do a great job, and you guys are great students. And so the reality is when people see this going on, they feel better about moving here and staying here. Once we, have, once we have those things in place, then we continue to work on our, our structure in our, in, our, in our city that makes it cleaner and nicer. For example, right now, we're working with projects downtown to try to bring back some of downtown. We know downtown will never be what it was in the 50s and 60s. It's just the nature of things. But that doesn't mean it has to be just a big empty space. And so we're working to bring in entertainment and bring in uh, venues for people to come and come downtown, hang out, place to shop and stuff like that. And so we work with, with private companies to come in and give consideration to doing that. And we've just recently had a couple new businesses locate, actually three, uh, locate downtown. And we're continuing to work to, to bring in more. Uh, we continue to work with our park departments. We think parks are important, uh, not just for places to go hang out and you know get, get in a swing set, but to make it again for young kids growing up and for older kids as they as they get older. So we're constantly trying to improve those types of structures too. So it's just a constant uh, effort to try to improve overall quality of life, really in every aspect that you can think of. Quite frankly. Well, going back again, and of course, youth is sort of a relative term. Some youth are down here, and youth are kind of up here. You know, you guys are youth too, and so it's a uh, it's an issue of trying to reach out to make things better for for all those ages of, of kids, from young young little kids all the way up to you know as you become young teenagers and older teenagers, uh, to make sure that we have stuff for for children to do. Uh, so again, uh, we, we for example this year last year now, right, 2016, uh, we had a summer program in terms of, of younger kids. Uh, these were for kids from about 8, 9, 10 years up to about 13 or 14. We had four different summer programs going uh, throughout the summer. We have a lot of kids in our community that, that can't afford to do a lot of stuff. Their parents can't afford to do a lot of stuff. So what we did was we uh, opened up four different uh, locations. Three of them were in schools. Um, and the four different locations, we basically had um, free lunches for all the kids, free snacks for all the kids, and then we did uh, field trips. Uh, we did it, recreational activities, um, and we did. We took kids, like for example, they went down to the Annapolis to the museum. We went down to the ball games down in Annapolis. Um, it, it was just a thing. It lasted several weeks. I can't remember the number of weeks, six, seven, eight weeks, but it gave those kids an opportunity to do some things that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Uh, for the older kids, we continue to work with uh, the, the businesses that come in. There's a lot of businesses that come in at, that are attracted to, to younger folks and trying to make things more relevant for them. And we try to back them up and give them uh, vehicles to, to be able to make them have a place to, to work with children. So it, again, it's a multitude of, of areas that we try to cover, but we're constantly, we understand that again, the future of our city uh, are the young folks and the future of our country is the young folks. So we understand that and we try to work as best we can to try to meet all those needs while at the same time meeting the normal needs of operation of a, of a city government.
we are we are continuing to, to work to bring in to bring business uh, uh, throughout the, the community. Uh, a lot of folks like to go to the south side of Anderson. The reason they like to do that in terms of businesses is it's near the interstate. And the interstate, of course, is kind of the lifeblood of, of a community. Way, way, way back in the day, it was rivers, but now it's interstates. So people like to go out there. We try to encourage businesses not just to go there, but businesses that don't necessarily need that immediate access to come to inner part of the city more uh, in order that they can set up shop and make it easier for, for folks uh, throughout the community to access them, uh, for example, in employment and so forth. So we work hard to try to bring in those kind of businesses. But we know that we don't want to let happen what happened going back that 20 some years ago again, where we put all of our eggs in one basket, where you had like General Motors, great employer, everybody worked there, was doing well, everything was, was really nice. The problem was when they left, it was all gone. So what we're trying to do is be more diverse and diversify and get different kinds of businesses in. We've been w reaching out and working with companies even in other uh, countries. And uh, right now, for example, we have off of Scatterfield Road, we have a company from Italy that's in the process of, of uh, they're about three quarters away on their plant through. And they're going to actually be manufacturing a uh, like a, a bio fertilizer uh, that's used for like table fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. Um, and it's made out of like soil product and they're going to be doing that um, their name is Italia Polina we have a uh, Japanese company that's in the process of uh, coming online they're about 80% done completed now um, their name is um, NTN, they're a Japanese company. Uh, they're going to be working on, on making products that are used in uh, uh, vehicles such as trucks uh, for their uh, drive drivetrain mechanisms. Uh, we have uh, another Japanese company here in town that, that works on uh, making um, Oh, plastic parts for like Honda and, and those kind of vehicles. Uh, we have, a, of course, Nestle is a Swiss company. So we have several companies that are from different different places, and so we're working with with those folks to try to expand employment opportunities. At the same time, those are bigger employers. Those are like two to five hundred or more employers. Well, at the same time, as we understand that a lot of them, there's a lot of small businesses in town. And so we're working with those small businesses to both keep them in town, the ones that are already here, work with them if they have issues to try to work things out, and at the same time, try to attract new businesses into town. Last year, like I was talking earlier about Anderson TV and our ribbon cuttings. One of the things that we do is a lot of times these new businesses want the mayor to come out and, and, and Chamber of Commerce comes out. We do have a little ceremony when we uh, welcome them to town. Well, last year we were involved in nearly 40 ribbon cuttings uh, just in that one year. And that was a lot. We're getting ready to do one here in a couple of days from now. So we have a lot of new businesses coming in. And so as they do, we try to showcase them and at the same time encourage them to, to um, you know, hold out their, their um, the, the fact that they're here to the customers and to the, to the folks of the community to help us continue to grow. So my goal is in a long term, and this is a long term goal, it can't happen overnight, but I would like to see us get back in population size where we once were and actually even beyond. And I know as folks and the community continues to grow from the Annapolis area and expand down this way, it's been going on ever since I was a young guy, but the reality is it is growing this way, but we want to help encourage that growth by showing folks why this is a great place to live and to settle. And so we're continuing to reach out across the, the region really to let people know Anderson's a good place to live. You look at what's going on in Chicago right now where, you know, one, two murders every day. Uh, Indianapolis has some crime issues. I mean, we're very lucky around here. We have issues, but we don't have the issues like they do. And as you guys know, you can go out to the mall, you can go out wherever, you run into friends and stuff, and you speak to people as you see them walking down the street. Everybody's friendly. They get along. That's not necessarily true everywhere else. This is a great place to live, and we just try to, to make sure people see that. As you guys know, and there's a lot of reasons for it, but as you know, there's a lot of empty buildings, particularly a lot of old residences that are kind of falling down and uh, they're just not savable. They're so far gone. When we came into office, uh, there was a, an award of money that the federal government had given to us to use on tearing down properties. Uh, they had received over $2 million, the city had, to be able to work on that project. Uh, the project had been in place for about a year and a half. Uh, only about 10% of that money had been expended, and so there was a lot of money left on the table, so to speak, that we could use for that project. We contacted the folks in the federal government. We asked them if we could have an extension of time to work on that program. They granted that. And since that time, we've torn down about two and a half more times 
property in this one year than they had the year and a half prior. So we've been working very diligently to try to clean up those properties. We have actually three different ways to do it. Uh, one of them is through what we call blight elimination program, and that's the program that had the money I was just speaking of. Uh, that's a program in which the owners of the property agree with us, and they don't fight us on it, and we, we work out a resolution where they allow us to tear down the properties, and then we try to find a partner to put that property back on the tax rolls as an empty lot, of course, but then those folks have the opportunity to develop it in some fashion or another. That's the one thing we do. The other way we do it is that we have property where the owners don't want to cooperate with us, but the place is really dilapidated, uh, could be dangerous uh, to the community or whatever. We go in and basically condemn that property, and then we can go in and tear down the property, and when we do it that way, we don't get the property. It remains theirs, but there becomes a lien on it uh, that we can try to enforce to get back our money of, of tearing stuff down. Um, and then we have that we have another way, which we can again partner partner with the folks, uh, but we use a different f uh, funding source, but it's similar to the to the first. So. We work very hard to do that. There's a lot of regulation and red tape, unfortunately, that comes with those monies that we get from the federal and state government. Um, and so it slows down the process, and that's one of the things we did this year was to try to change that process, to speed it along, and given the fact that we were able to get down those two, two and a half times more properties, I think that's working. In fact, I met with a lady today that oversees that property and sort of got updated on it, and we feel pretty good about it. Um, so we're continuing to work on it. The problem is there's so many of them. I mean, you could start today and keep doing it, and there's going to be more. The other thing we're trying to do is stop that from happening. And what we're doing is we're reaching out to, to folks that still own their homes, but, but they're having trouble, they're struggling. And so we're trying to work with them to uh, make arrangements where we can assist them in some uh, home remodeling and improvements. Uh, and we're able to, to work with them, and they sign a contract, and they agree to d make certain changes to their homes, and we can help fund some of that through some of these uh, funding sources that we get in grants. And so long as they live there, for a certain period of time and maintain the property, then that's a way to help improve it. If we can stop the stuff from getting so bad that it eventually just goes down the tubes, um, it's better to save them and bring them back up if you have the chance. And so that's what we're working on there. As you guys all know, Narcan is a is a drug that can be administered to somebody who's overdosed on a heroin product and can uh, save their life uh, if they're in a cardiac arrest situation. There's a lot of controversy about it in some areas because uh, there's some thought that it encourages people who are illegally using drugs to um, not worry about it too much. Somebody will sort of sh uh, show up and save them. Uh, on the other hand, there's obviously the, the, the thought process, if we can save somebody and get them on the right path, uh, that that's the, the smarter way to go. Uh, our police department, Anderson Police Department, and the Anderson Fire Department both have Narcan available. We have partnered with uh, Community Hospital and St. Vincent's Hospitals in order to help get training and, and, um, and acquire those drugs uh, for the departments. Um, the, uh, um, the hospitals have given the training to make sure that the officers and police officers know how to, how to administer those drugs, and so we do use them. So I do support it because I believe in, uh, I believe you have to try to save somebody. If you, if you come across somebody in their need uh, to being saved, I don't think it's appropriate to make a judgment at that point in time about their lifestyle. I think it's more important to try to save them, and then once you've, you've done that, then you need to work with those folks to try to get them on the right path and avoid what's gotten them to the point where they are today. The, at the first of this last year, the Anderson City Council formed a, a committee uh, to basically work as a council group towards some um, study and resolutions to try to help uh, the homeless population in the community. We, uh, outside of that, uh, as you know, there's several organizations in, in town that work closely with uh, various social agencies to try to help different people who find themselves to be homeless. And as you all know, there's a lot of reasons that people find themselves to be homeless. There's a lot of, um, it's not every homeless person has the same issue. Uh, we have folks who have a lot of mental issues and mental health problems and they need professional help uh, to try to assist them, uh, to try to bring them out of the uh, places where they find themselves to be. Uh, we have some folks 
folks who just economically find themselves uh, in bad straits because they've lost a job, they're just overwhelmed with their, with their finances, and they, they find themselves, they lose their homes, they find themselves to be homeless, uh, no fault of their own, so to speak. Um, and then we have individuals who, for different reasons, uh, choose that lifestyle. And so again, it requires some form of intervention or, or discussion. Uh, one of the, we have a lot of partnerships in the city. We don't we, everything we do. We don't do just by ourselves. Um, city government isn't it doesn't have enough money to do that. We're not big enough to do that. So we have to reach out and work with other uh, entities, some nonprofits uh, companies, some profit companies. We need to work with them to try to, to better the community overall. Uh, an example, one of the things we've been working with, and, and one of the groups that's involved, for example, on homelessness, is the Christian Center. Uh, as you know, last year, the, and you may know, last year the Christian Center uh, served over 90,000 meals. I just met yesterday with the, the, um, the, uh, the director over there, Rob Spaulding, and he was explaining to me some of the things they've been doing to try to address the homeless issue and has asked for us to help partnership with them uh, to try to, to improve things even more. Um, I can tell you that they work hard, as other, as other um, agencies do, to try to give temporary homes to folks, to give um, uh, counseling, and to reach out in, in terms of helping them with education and also help find folks jobs that are employable. And so we're doing pretty good in the city. We still have that as an issue. Uh, we actually do still have a few people that live down by the river, live in a tent, that sort of thing. But his estimate is that we probably have 100 true homeless people that aren't staying somewhere uh, on any given night. And while that's not good, it's far cry better in a lot of communities, and we're constantly trying to reach out to make that better. I will tell you that our, our, like our police and fire, they work very closely when they come across folks. You know, we do things to try to help them. We don't do things to cause folks that are having that kind of despair problems. We try to uplift them, get them somewhere that's safe and clean, and then put them in touch with people that'll help make their lives better. I believe the answer is yes. The quick answer is yes. Uh, in the past, years ago, we had a, a very healthy crime watch program here in the community. Uh, as time changed and as, as policies changed, there was a, a less of an emphasis of, of uh, neighborhood type of crime watch programs, and it became a little bit more regionalized. Uh, when we came in, we I looked at it when I was running for office, and I think the better approach is to have it in a, in a more neighborhood type of setting because you guys all live in your own neighborhoods, and uh, wherever you live, you, you sort of know what your neighborhood issues are, and maybe two neighborhoods away, even though it's not that far away geographically, it, it's maybe a lot different in what's going on. And so we think it's important to, to have smaller groups to make sure that, that the police understand the needs of those special, those particular neighborhoods. So we've set up up uh, a, a new way to do cr uh, uh, crime watch to establish more groups. We've added several more um, new crime watch uh, groups, I guess. Uh, since we've come in, uh, we've assigned more police officers to that. It's, in, in general terms, it's called community policing. Uh, but we think it's very important to have good relationships. That way, when, when a person, you know, you live in your neighborhood and you see a problem, you know who the officers are that are involved, and you feel comfortable about calling them up and saying, hey, here's what's going on, and then they can come and help attend to the need. In addition to our Crime Watch program, sort of a spinoff of that a little bit, we started this year or last year a, a new program having to do with uh, burglary and theft units. We had a lot of burglaries that were going unsolved, and so we put together a special unit that really started studying closer, uh, sort of the, the you know, where burglaries tend to be happening, uh, the sort of the traits of, of, of you know sort of the MOs, you know what was going on, and we've been able to solve a lot more burglaries through that. So we think that's part of our our Crime Watch and community policing program too. So. We feel, we feel good about it. We do think it's a, there's lots of pieces to the puzzle to solve a lot of these problems, but that's one of them, and we think it's a, it's a good one. I, uh, my thought is no. Uh, I mean, I will say this. I mean, we do live in a capitalistic society, and so what that means, of course, is if, if uh, 
you know, you've got five ice cream stores and there's everybody wants ice cream, you know, maybe one of them's going to end up going out of business because, you know, you don't have enough customer base. Uh, but on the other hand, if you don't have enough businesses, uh, then there's not enough choices for the, for the public. So I think, and reality is, I think that we have, in this town at least right now, we have a situation where we can, uh, you know, I think we can service, we can continue to bring these businesses in, even duplicate businesses. Most, most retailers will tell you that if they've got a They've got their ice cream shop here, and there's one next door. They actually get business out of that because you're going down to get an ice cream cone, and this one's busy, so you go next door and so forth. So they actually feed off of each other. That's why a lot of times you'll see these fast food restaurants, you know, right in, one next to the other, and then they're doing fine. They're doing fine. So now I think we're I think we're okay there. I think we definitely can use more business. In fact, we just did a study the other day. We're working on getting the, the balance of statistics from it, uh, showing us that how many. Um, how many potential customers different businesses would have. It's a real detailed study that sort of uh, goes deeply into the demographics of the community and get, looks at your, um, your buying habits and so forth using like information that's public through credit card purchases and internet purchases and all that. And anyway, by looking at it in certain sections of town, they, they can give you a figure as to the percentage of extra business that could be available for a given retailer. So right now, all those studies are tending to suggest that in most areas, we could actually use additional businesses. The primary checks and balances in the city government typically doesn't necessarily uh, include the city court as one of the three branches in terms of checks and balances, even though it's one of our three branches. Um, there is a judicial branch uh, of, of a state level court, which is like over in the courthouse, that would typically be the, the more likely check and balance on the judicial side. But the way it works uh, normally is that uh, if there's a piece of legislation, sort of just like in Congress, if there was a piece of legislation, in this case we call it an ordinance, uh, um, that a that somebody wanted to have passed in order to you know it, it could be creating it could be to to change a speed limit sign it it could be to um, to to create a a uh, you know some form of program that they think is, is important or whatever they can they can do a, an ordinance to pass that. Once they pass that, it comes to the mayor for consideration. And we have 10 days to look at it and decide whether or not we agree that it's a good idea or a bad idea. If we don't like it, we can veto it. Uh, if we veto it, then it goes back to them, and then they get a, a second shot at it, so to speak, but they have to, they have to pass it by more than a simple majority in order to get it past the veto. Uh, on the other hand, if I sign off on it, then I approve it, and it obviously becomes the same, have, uh, the same effect as the law as, a, as an ordinance. If somebody either in the government or outside the government thinks it's a bad law and they don't agree with it, uh, then they can ask for a judicial review of that law by going to one of those court systems like at the courthouse and overseeing it. So that's the way it works. And also there's, uh, I mentioned earlier, like appointments to boards. Uh, again, we have a lot of boards that control a lot of different things in the city. Oftentimes I have some appointments on that board. The city council members have some appointment on that board. So. They get, they get a voice there, we get a voice there. And so it's, it's just a mix and a coming together, but they are separate and distinct branches. Um, I've talked a little bit about uh, what I think are some of the key issues. Economic development, obviously, is an important one. And we talked a little bit about the things we're doing right now to try to attract new business. Uh, when we work with new businesses, it's not unusual for these bigger companies, when they come in, to want some form of tax break. And the problem is, if you don't do that, then they go somewhere else. So it's a balance of figuring out how do you work with a new company to encourage them to come here, to give them some kind of benefit, but at the same time, make sure they pay enough taxes to help us run our government and make sure, again, we have all the, the things that we'd all like to have when it comes to amenities here in the, in the community and so forth. So we work closely with them to try to, uh, try to strike that balance in order to, to help grow the economy. So growing the economy is very important. Uh, the other thing is, again, the quality of life. We talked about a little bit ago, and we talked a little bit about some of the things we're doing to try to improve the quality of life overall. Uh, again, it's, again, it's important to me to make sure that we have our basic services that are continuing to, to work. I mean, you know, we, we all read in the paper and saw on the internet again all the stuff going on with regards to, uh, for example, Flint, Michigan. And, you know, we're unsafe drinking water that was, you know, at a critical stage where, where you know, 
people are actually being harmed. And we need to make sure that we have clean drinking water. We need to make sure that, that uh, you know, when you cl turn on that faucet that you can safely drink out of it and not worry about it. And we do. Uh, we, test our, we test our water several times every day to make sure that, that things are clean and safe. So those kind of basic services are, are very important. Another uh, concern of mine is, the, is the, again, the population growth. I want to, we've slowed down. I just want to stop that, that flow of people from our community and, and have them stay here and at the same time bring new people in to rebuild. Because the more folks that we have here living in, as a community, then the better we're going to thrive. So to me, those are, those are sort of the essentials of, of trying to run government. And what we do is just every day, uh, we work hard to try to, to meet those goals. In our, in our local government system, we have the, the city of Anderson, which I've talked about obviously here, is the part we control and it's city government. Of course, the city is, is one of several uh, towns and cities in the county. And of course, we all live in Madison County. And certain functions of government are ran by the county part. And the jail is one of them. And our jail uh, was built many, many years ago to house 208 people. Uh, runs about 230, 235 people on a, on a regular basis. It is overcrowded. Uh, the county, again, it's not a city function, but the county has taken steps to try to alleviate that. They've, they've opened a, a work release center. They've just recently built a brand new work release center that they've opened up to move some folks that are appropriate uh, not to be in jail, but to be at work release. They also have a, 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 an entity called MCCC, which is a complex where they can kind of keep people in sort of a dormitory setting that aren't violent uh, to help over, uh, help that as well. Uh, I know there's some uh, thoughts by the by the county to build a new jail, and the last time I heard, I think they're estimating maybe a seven to ten year out time frame to do that. It, it obviously be very expensive, uh, but they are looking at that, and the, the people that are involved in those decisions uh, are their executive in the county is called the county commissioners, and there's three of them, three county commissioners that make those decisions. So that's what's going on there. Uh, again, there's lots of ways to do it and lots of avenues, so to speak. Uh, one is obviously I th still think it's very important that folks uh, get engaged in terms of trying to pay attention to what's going on in government at all levels and to, to uh, take the opportunity to vote when you have the chance. As you know, uh, in our country, we tend to have two, sometimes three, uh, political parties. Uh, you don't have to necessarily align yourself with any one political party over the other, but as you go through life and look at issues and policies, you'll probably find that one or the other part, major parties probably come closer to meeting your, your thoughts and, and uh, values than others. Each one of those party organizations at, all, at the local level, all the way up to the national level, uh, have offices. They have people that work there. They have people that literally answer the phone if you call them up. And I can tell you that whether or not it's the Republican Party, the Democrat Party locally, either side would welcome any of you in, show you what's going on, get to meet people, uh, see if you're interested in it or not. And then if you are, then you're off and running, so to speak. So. I would just encourage you not to be shy about that. I think sometimes people look at the political process and think it's kind of a, a closed door and that I'm not welcome there. I'd feel uncomfortable. Um, you'd be welcome uh, at either one of those places I know. And so I would, I would encourage you to go to their local headquarters, talk to them, especially when it's near election time. Those things are going on. There's always a lot of activity, and they're always looking for volunteers and people to get engaged. And the more you get engaged, the more you'll find it to, to be an interesting thing to do, I think. Again, the ones I was talking about, where they, now that we do have some larger ones, like I said, they're in the process of opening. Uh, the NTN, uh, Sir Max finally got up and going. They're over there on uh, Rabel and uh, 29th Street MLK uh, area. 
Uh, again, we have the Italia Polina that's in the process of, of getting ready to open. Uh, so, and we also have an expansion at GTI, which is a manufacturing, which we, uh, they added another 200 jobs over there. Uh, the ones I was speaking of specifically, though, are um, sort of, I'm gonna call them mom and pop shops, so to speak, you know, three, four, five to 10, 10 employees. I can't remember all the names off the top of my head, but uh, we, we did have an ice cream store out on uh, 53rd Street open up. Uh, we've had a, uh, we had two bakeries open earlier this year, one down at the mall. We had another one open uh, over off of uh, Park Road. Uh, we have, um, David, can you think? I can't. Yeah, we had yeah we had two different salons open. Yeah, there's several. I can't, you can get on the you can go to the uh, Anderson.com website, and there's a listing there of, of all the businesses, and there's also a little link that clicks on to show you all the different ribbon cuttings and gives you the the detail of the places and the locations. Goals at the end of the term is uh, to, to, to try to, to, to basically end up where I've been talking about a little bit, uh, stabilize population, increase in some population, uh, bringing in new businesses that expand the tax base. We have a, we have a real problem in, in local government in the state. They, they put in place several years ago a thing called tax caps. And uh, what it basically amounts to is it, 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 it seals the amount of property taxes that homeowners have to pay and business owners have to pay. And it basically has, has lessened the amount of money that's available to, to local units of government. So the only way you can solve that problem is either cut back on the size of government, which most local units no matter what city you're in, no matter what county you're in, have already done that because this is something that happened a few years ago. So they're, they're really working off of you know, pretty minimal budgets compared to what they have to do. So the only other way to, to address that problem is to expand your tax base, bring in more business, more homes, uh, new entities that, that add to that. And that's something that's really important, again, if you're going to, because again, you know, money's like everything else in your own personal lives too, you have to have it to operate. You know, our budget for the city of Anderson is $31 million, just our, our normal budget, not including utility issues. So we have a big budget, but there's a lot to do when you talk about, you know, 670 employees and all the roads and streets and everything else we have to do, so. Um, Last year, about in May, uh, we help, every year they have a, a mayor's ball. And uh, in the past, that ball has been used to raise money uh, for some like beautification efforts downtown and all that. And that's fine, but I wanted to do something a little more than that. And so I looked at it from a standpoint of what could we do to help try to raise some money for, for education, for kids, for schools. So we held, a, we held a ball, and when we got done, we had raised, um, after expenses and so forth, we ended up with around $22,000, $23,000. And so with that money, uh, we let it be known that we would accept grant applications and requests uh, for schools and teachers to make an application because there's a lot of teachers that, you know, for $1,000, $1,500, they could do a lot with a class that they just don't have that extra money because of the way uh, funding goes for the education today. So we're doing that to try to help 10 or 15 different, different classrooms or schools uh, to be able to do something special with their kids this year. And we're going to be doing something similar again later on this year to, to try to do that again. Again, it's just a way to try to work closer with the schools because the city mayor, at least, isn't directly involved in making decisions for school systems, but we can work with them to help and enhance the opportunity for kids uh, by working together as partners again. Uh, school system in terms of decisions on on schools and, and that operation is is not in the hands of, of, the, of a city mayor uh, those decisions are determined by a, an elected uh, school board that we have here uh, the elected school board also hires a superintendent of schools in the public school system and that person administers those decisions subject to the school board's operation uh, you may or may not know that recently the superintendent of the Anderson public schools uh, 
uh, has uh, presented to the school board a proposal to uh, basically uh, borrow a fairly a large sum of money in order to try to improve the physical facilities of the Anderson Public School System, which would include uh, increasing the size to, to alleviate some of the overcrowding issues and also m make better physical facilities and all that sort of in its infancy stage. It's something that may come before the voters again in uh, May of 2018, I think is the plan right now, but that would be something that they would that they would do. Yes, ma'am. Well, I want to take the opportunity again to, to thank everybody. Uh, I want you to know we are located on the fifth floor of Anderson City Hall. Uh, you're always welcome to come uh, anytime you want. Come as a group, come individually, come with your parents, whatever you want. If you ever have any questions about issues that you're having in the city, Everything from, hey, there's a chuck hole out in front of my house that hadn't been filled forever, uh, to something you think's a, a real problem in the city that ought to be addressed. You should always feel free and comfortable about calling because, uh, you know, I had one day when somebody said to me, it's like, well, I just feel like I'm complaining. I said, I don't consider it a complaint. I, you know, it's part of what we need is people that are in our community to let us know where issues are for we can try to address them. Can't fix everything, but what we can fix, we want to when we can. So we can't fix it, we don't know about it. So always feel free to come and, and uh, let your voice be heard.